if Miss Kate Thomas would lead us in the salute to the flag, please. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. And with that, we will go to Madam Clerk for the roll call. Good morning, Madam Chair. Marsha Bergbrigler, Chair. Here. Katie Jung. Present. Bob Lucy is absent. Von Hartung. Present. Jeannie Herman. Here. County Manager John Slaughter. Present. Assistant District Attorney Paula Pirelli. Here. I'm Nancy Parent, County Clerk. You have a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We will go to now to public comment. Mr. Manager. Item three on the agenda is public comment. Comment heard under the item is limited to three minutes per person, may pertain to matters both on and off the commission agenda. The commission will also hear public comment during individual action items with comment limited to three minutes per person, and comments are to be made to the commission as a whole. Thank you. We will start with Ms. Tammy Holtstell. Could we have the overhead, please? Good morning. Good morning, Tammy Heldstill, Lemon Valley Swan Lake Recovery <coughs> Committee for the record. The water's still there, I'm still here. We are still here. Um, i like to start off with the Lemon Valley residents, and it wasn't only Lemon Valley residents, it was all of Washoe County, whether it be City of Reno or whatever, joined together with the Lemon Valley residents. And you guys have been served today. We have filed a judicial review regarding your Prado Ranch so along those lines, I'd like to know why staff and commissioners are not doing their due, due diligence because if you were doing your due diligence, you would be understanding FEMA and your own regulations about building in floodplains. That whole area is a floodplain. I showed you the pictures, but yet it was more important to wheel and deal and be off track and violate the open meeting law than it was to do what you were supposed to be doing, which was looking at all the facts. You did not. We will prove it in court. It's time for Washoe County to start listening to its residents. You on that board should be reading every single piece of paper you get before you make a decision on anything. All you're doing is creating an issue down the road because if this ultimately goes through and the residents are flooded, at least there's going to be nice documentation that Washoe County is going to be on the hook for. And I would think you would be thinking fiduciary and be thinking, do we really want to put more people in harm's way and cause a lawsuit down the road that we're gonna to have to pay out money for to fix a problem that we haven't fixed yet? Those are the issues you should be looking at. Not whether, oh boy, can we get some more money or not? Or this man's got con contributed to my campaign and he's got my arm twisted. There's other ways to do things. And it's not the way that you're doing it right now. And it is embarrassing to see Washoe County like this. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Ms. Cassidy Stetzer. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm here today. Um, we have, I'm a resident of Sun Valley. Would you state your name on the record? Please? It's Cassidy Stetzer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a resident of Sun Valley and we have petitioned to we have a really big problem with people dumping stuff on our road. And the man, I would talk to Ms. Herman, emailed back and forth. Um, we have a real problem with somebody on our road accepting cash payments to use the road basically as a dump. And I've contacted code enforcement. We've been on the news. It's a big problem. There's homeless people living out there in cars and trucks. Um, we have over 100 signatures on this paper from people around the residents wanting it cleaned up, wanting the road fixed. And everyone we talk to, it's, it's a roadblock. We can't get it paved. We can't get it cleaned up because it's a private road. 
that the county or the city have actually owned for 25 years deed it back to the people who owned it who have now passed away and so the county's putting all the commit all of the all of it onto the Fink's um, heirs of the property, which I'm not even sure if they know that they own the property anymore because it was in the city's, um, in the city's lien. And so Miss Herman has, I've talked to her about the problem. She's actually came down there and she knows about the problem and it's beyond ridiculous. It's a safety hazard, it's a fire hazard everything about it. We've put, we've put this petition in order and we have had people, um, we just ran it for the next board meeting to be on the agenda. I'm done. Okay, thank you very much. You. Next is Mr. Jay Hampton. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jay Hampton, and I own a piece of property just off of Quartz Lane that Ms. Spetzer was referring to. Um, it is my understanding that the county owned that road, Quartz Lane, for about 25 years, and then maybe a year and a half ago, decided to rescind its deed, probably because it didn't want the headache. But if the county doesn't take care of it, nobody will and it's, it is becoming very dangerous. There's, it's just a complete, absolute dump going down the side of that road. Um, so I think when the county rescinded their deed, I'm not sure if the people that had, had originally been foreclosed on for failure to pay taxes, I don't think they were even alive at that point in time. So it just went nowhere. And nobody has any incentive to take responsibility. Everybody's saying they can't do anything about it. So I really think the only people that can help us is the commission. I, I don't think anybody else has any authority or ability to do it. And you probably could rescind your rescission and take title back to that property and, and have it cleaned up. But um, if somebody doesn't do something, you know, somebody is probably gonna end up getting hurt. It's, it's not a good place. It's not a good uh, situation. So I, I just would ask for your help at least to put it on the agenda, take a close look at it and see if there's anything we could do. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next is Miss Tanya Brown. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is um, Tanya Brown. Um, I'm going to read something. My name is Ann Murray Grant. My brother Thomas Purdy was hogtied by the <coughs> Reno PD on 10-4-2015 for 40 minutes during a, a mental health crisis. Instead of getting him medical attention, they hogtied him and dumped him up at the Washoe Jail. Instead of the deputies heeding the pleas of my brother for his life, they chose to smother him to death. He was the second of three homicides at the hands of the deputies at the jail within one year. During the period which all of you were ne neglecting your duties as county commissioners on a, under NRS 211.020, I had, to, had a, to burn a community member, Tanya Brown, to come today during her work hours to voice my so my voice can be heard as I have been silently repeated, yes, she is a taxpayer. Since July 2018, I have faithfully submitted public comments with written prepared remarks via email as well as twice via U.S. Postal Mail to County Clerk requesting per the NRS 241.035 the substance of remarks made by any member of the general public who address if the the member of the general public requests that the minutes reflect those remarks or if the member of the general public has not prepared written remarks, a copy of the prepared written remarks if the member of the general public submits a copy for inclusion. I was informed that the assistant DA, Mr. Liparelli, has 
a skewed interpretation of the NRS. I was advised that the documents submitted electronically are not the equivalent of addressing the public body under the NRS I had cited. Requires inclusion of the minutes of the substance of the remark made to the public body where the speaker addresses the public body. Electronically submitted communications from people who are not present to address the board are not remarks made to the public body for the purpose of NRS 241.035. I hope Washoe County Commissioners are not discriminating against discriminating, but it appears they are. This skewed interpretation certainly is not conducive for the elderly, homeless, people who work during public meeting hours and are disabled. What about community members who are not capable of attending the meeting in person due to disabilities, either cognitive or physical? That means their opinions and concerns should not be heard. It's interesting to me that the substance of my comments were particularly favorable to those of you who are up for re-election. I would hope that there were it ulterior motives to refusing my documents and comment in the media and agenda minutes as the NRS directs? Was it done to shield your reputations from public adverse opinions? The legislature's intent was not for anyone to be excluded, thus the legislature accepts documents and comments via email. Once again, I'm requesting that the substance of my remarks be included in the minutes and my documents be attached to an applicable agenda item for viewing by all. The First Amendment right to freedom of speech is not one that the commissioner should be violating. Just because comments aren't favorable to yourself does not mean you get to silence a person making them. Mr. Purdy's Thomas, fa Thomas's father would like to reamend you your three done? minutes are up. Can you wind it up? Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, remind you the 13 deaths who were three ruled homicide, including his son, at the hands of deputies. All, cons all occurred at the jail while you were neglecting your duties under NRS 21.02. Election time is coming. The community Please, has the power. Thank you. Thank um, you. She has stated that um, she's also sent you, uh, mailed, emailed you and mailed mm -hmm. uh, all the documents and including this letter to be placed on the public record under the agenda item, public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Madam Chair, those um, comments that she just read were submitted via email to me, and I'll put them in the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Michael Pitkin. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael Pitkin. I am a homosexual, HIV positive, Satanist, and no, I do not automatically make me a pedophile, murderer, or rapist. I advocate for morality reform in the code for myself and for others through acts of compromise and peaceful coexistence. I am aware of opioid ad campaigns from the, camp, from the county all the way to the governor's office. They are not mandates. <clears throat> These ads do not touch on the topic of patient medical undertreatment or updating physician service quality standards through the AMA, HRSA, and CDC. Where are the legal protections in the law for people who do not have a criminal record but still want opioid and other street drug medical treatment? HIPAA does not guarantee against leaks to law enforcement and judges. Drug treatment medical records can legally be used against people to help incarcerate. I believe the United States war on drugs has been in the wrong direction. I believe all street drugs should be taken from the mafia and cartel control and be legal and managed by the United States government. I believe in supervised safer injection facilities. I believe in safer drug consumption services provided by legally sanctioned facilities in control settings. I am aware of the Federal Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, also the Public Health Service Act of 2018. I am aware of public nuisance law, Homeland Security, DEA, joined together Northern Nevada law enforcement partners. I am trained in harm reduction. I am also aware of false accusations, entrapments against innocent people. Many values, ethics, and morality and code laws can be religious bullying in disguise. When politics and religious bias entered my medical care by the way of medical undertreatment, it proved there are more reactions from people versus logic and reasoning. I got all of this from Harm Reduction Action Center, Drug Policy Alliance, and Law Enforcement for Drug Reform. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Donald Fossum.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to start with a happy note by saying uh, I'm grateful for the uh, uh, senior programs you support in Washoe County, particularly the dance programs. Uh, I'm here today uh, uh, to appear as a volunteer to assist the commission in correcting a dire voter fraud problem. Uh, the problem is I've been getting lots of extra voter registration people registered to my home. A lot of people aren't uh, aware of this. It puts your own offices in jeopardy. Uh, I have now four voting squatters posted to my address, which means I'm possibly outvoted four to one. <laughs> Think about what that does for you. And none of them have prior residency. I don't run the kind of place where uh, these uh, voter registration people, who are not the sharpest pencils I've ever seen on the block, uh, can walk around, go up to a house where there are people <coughs> hanging out, take their names, they don't have a place to live, say, oh, well, we can use this address. Wow. Uh, So I just hold up some evidence for you. I have more at home that I didn't have time to gather. When uh, one of your kind members reminded me, I could be here at 10 o'clock to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and next is Mr. Levi Hooper. Good morning, Mr. Hooper. Well, hello, everybody. I am uh, Levi Hooper. I'm the voice of the downtrodden. I am a homeless advocate. Uh, I've been coming to the podium for years and talking to everybody. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, people are going to die this year and uh, this winter here in Reno. And uh, the average family has like 8 to 13 people in it. And I mean, there's going to be way more than that that die this year. So imagine your whole family worth of people are dying on the street this year uh, during the winter. Um, what I do is I come here and ask for help and advice and whatnot. And, uh, I'm offering today that if anybody wants to help the homeless directly, they could talk to me. Uh, I, I, any clothing or whatnot, I have a couple of families that need clothing. About $1,000 worth of clothing is needed for these families, roughly. They have nothing. They just uh, got here and from another from Arizona, not realizing that winter's coming. And then the guy was, had a job here, and he came, and the job wasn't there, and he got here. So anyway, uh, uh, I want to also um, say thank you and uh, congratulate you all on uh, taking the advice of Sam on uh, putting public comment up front <laughs> and before everything. You know, it just makes it a lot easier for, uh, you know, for everybody to understand what's going on. That's all, you know, instead of halfway through something, we hop into public comment, you know. I just think it's a little bit easier that way. And also for people who don't want to sit through the whole meeting or whatnot. But, um, uh, going back to my homeless thing, yeah, uh, I, I just want to uh, make a couple seconds of silence for uh, the homeless people, and uh, that, that starts now. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, if there's any, anyone uh, wants to uh, um, contact me directly, uh, I have a business card. Um, my email address is uh, treyself at gmail.com. And uh, my phone number is 775-737-1037. But um, if there's any advice or anything anyone could help me on to give me a call on that. And uh, yeah, anything anyone wants to help to support the homeless today, I'm here. Uh, you can meet me outside or whatever. Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to uh, waste my 44 seconds of uh, freedom clock, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to, uh, yeah, talk about uh, Midtown and that too uh, down there. Um, the lady that got uh, kicked out of her apartment for renovation purposes, she was supposed to be able to come back in a couple months. Well, we come to find out that her rent that was 560 after renovations is going to be $1,000. So there's no way she's going to be able to get back into her, her own apartment she lived in for 13 years. So yeah, it's going to be a hard thing, a hard thing. Um, and that, that Midtown thing is just crazy. I mean, I've seen so much crime going on down in that little area too because the cops can't get around down there either. And there's so much homeless sleeping and whatnot down there. It's going to be really, really bad mixed up. But that's all I have to say. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Mr. Sam Dene.
Good morning, Mr. Denae. Nice smiley face. Sam, DNA, Denae. Wasted part of my time saying hi to all my fans out there. I'm an Air Force Academy graduate. I'm the heart and the soul and the body and mind of Reno government. We've got important people in this building who might come, want to come to the podium and say, no, Sam is not the heart and soul and the body and mind of Reno government. We've got important government people here could easily come to the podium and say, Sam is not the heart and soul and the body and mind. Or they could say, Sam is the heart and soul and the body and mind. i am been to every government meeting since 1994 minus two. I'm an Air Force Academy graduate. I flew fighters and bombers defending our nation. And of course, it takes me quite a while to, that's a very small definition of my introduction. But first of all, I want to compliment, and I'm thankful to the, the person over there in, in uh, Tahoe Reno Industrial Complex who voted to not steal water from the citizens here and voted to not have us pay for a hundred million dollar pipeline to take the water over there. Whoever you are, you have Sam's compliments for it and thank you for listening to Sam's directives last week and the week before and the week before. That is abominable and these people have said nothing about it. Next of all, I want to, as, as Levi said, I want to compliment you for following Sam's directives because in the previous meetings you put the fall de roll, the fall de roll in front of public comment. And then she's looking over at the fall de roll that's going to follow me right now. I see her right there smiling. At any rate, uh, it's the only thing to do. It's so easy to do the right thing. And it turns out that, believe it or not, the fall de roll behind Sam today happens to be Colonel Kazmierski, the head of economic. Development Authority of Western Nevada, known as EDON. Colonel Kazmierski long ago uh, coerced me into helping bring Tesla Gigafactory to Reno. And then he was the only person in the history of my entire crusade, my entire holy crusade, crusade the only person in the history to come to the podiums and thank Sam for being as great as he is and as brilliant and humble as he is. Yes, he is. Now he's smiling over there now saying, well, I don't think I said you were brilliant. But anyway, he did thank me. And a thank you from anybody in the community of the government bureaucracy to thank Sam is a dangerous thing. But that man is a West Point graduate. He's got courage that he learned at the West Point. And now he's a retired colonel and he's here trying to save Reno. The only problem is <laughs> he's using your money to try to save Reno. What are the chances? I wasn't trying to pick on him. He's a good man, no doubt about it. So um, that's it. Thank you, thank you over there. Thank you and thank you. And you're so lucky to listen thank to you, that Mr. three minutes. Today. Next is Ms. Catherine Snedeker. Good morning, Ms. Snedeker. Good morning. For the record, my name is Katherine Snedeker. I'm a non-person, non-resident, unenfranchised, natural woman, human being. Uh, I want to start, Madam Chairman, by uh, acknowledging my comment about the volunteer fire department were not allowed to leave their trucks. I'm sure you were told something different that day. But I have Kathy Glather who's the administrator for the Volunteer Fire Department, who absolutely confirmed what I said, because she was so proud of our volunteers being on standby. That means they didn't get out of the truck. They weren't allowed to, probably because they'd be interfering with union jobs. The other thing I want to talk about is this Bob Marshall thing, the development thing. It, you really don't want to hear from us. You really do not want to hear what the people have to say. Because if you did, we'd be having CAB meetings about this development, which is apparently the only reason we can have a CAB meeting anymore. And we haven't heard word one. And so I'd like you, honestly, I would like you to tell me how many subdivisions in this state are based on surface water? How many developments have you approved 
that involve surface water for the 217 homes that are going to be there. And then what does that do to everybody else as well? We have had no discussion on this. And we won't have a discussion on it until next month. And that will be our one and only discussion on it. That's abominable. You don't care about us. You care about how much that developer is going to put in your pocket when you vote for him. We already have a big problem in the SPA. It's in a flood zone. And by Trevor Lloyd's uh, comments, unable to enforce what's happening in that area. When a developer builds three houses and then waits and then builds another three and then waits and then builds another three, that's usurping the system and the county can absolutely do something about that. However, you have chose not to. When that place floods and when Bob Marshall's plan runs out of water because they ran out of surface water rights, you're going to have a lot of problems. Next is Ms. Kathy Cook. Good afternoon, or good morning, Ms. Cook. I'm rushing the day here. <laughs> okay. My name is Kathy Cook. I'm a, a realtor, mainly in Sun Valley. I have a client, a seller, who has asked me to bring a question to your meeting today. He has three properties in neighborhood commercial zoning at 6 and Sun Valley Boulevard, which is now, as you know, neighborhood commercial, no homes can be put there. Uh, he got the notice that says that you're thinking about changing this. And he asked if I could mention to you that he built out the three properties to the requirements in place at the time, including pulling permits to do it. They are now very difficult to sell, as is even while negating most of the permitted infrastructure I put in. So he just wanted me to let you know he's in Alaska, he can't be here, and he's hoping that this new change for the master plan will go through. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no more public comment, we will close public comment and bring and it back Madam to Chair, excuse me. For yes, the record, I did receive some uh, comment from Anne Marie Grant, which I will place on the record. Okay, thank you very much. We will bring it back to the board, and we are on to the appearance of Mr. Kesmierski, Mr. Manager. Madam Chair, next item is item four, and this is an appearance by Mike Kesmierski, President and CEO of EDON, the Economic Development Authority of Western Nevada, uh, giving us his annual update. Good morning, Mr. Kesmierski. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, commissioners and uh, staff. First of all, I want to thank you again for the fantastic support we get from the county from the top down. Uh, chair, your attendance at our board meetings and involvement in what we do on a regular basis is greatly appreciated and council members for uh, your involvement in our events, connecting with companies. Uh, very important, this is a team effort and you are a very important part of our team, so thank you. Um, Commissioner or uh, Manager Slaughter is on our executive committee on the EDON board as well and involved in our day-to-day -day activities uh, as we look at where the organization is going. So it really is a community effort in trying to grow the economy in a, a reasonably smart way, bringing in great jobs, and we want to thank you for being a part of that effort. Uh, just a quick review on EDON and what we do. Our focus is pretty much uh, all about jobs. And we're really talking about quality jobs, high paying jobs, jobs that our kids and grandkids will want, not just now, but decades from now. Um, the companies we have here, we want to help grow, retain and grow so that they can be successful. And then finally, adding additional jobs on the entrepreneurial side. How do we get entrepreneurs to be successful here? And that really is everything we do orients towards those three objectives, the three legs of economic development. Workforce development is a subset of that, feeds into all three legs of economic development. And you notice community development at the bottom. We need a great community if we're going to be successful. So we get involved at times in community activities that allow us ultimately to grow. 
uh, in a, in a uh, smart way. If you look at our numbers, this is kind of an indicator of where the jobs are, are jobs coming in the future. When prospects visit, we get a very high closure rate. Our goal is to get great companies to come visit this region and then ultimately to land them here. Um, you notice our, uh, the last, this last year, our prospect numbers are actually down. That is not an accident. We have actually decreased our marketing efforts and have tried to focus more and more on the smaller high wage companies. We no longer need to put hundreds or thousands of people to work. What we need to do is upgrade the skills of our existing industry so that people can get better jobs and certainly be able to afford the higher rents and things that are happening as well. As a result of that, you can see our uh, five-year average there and the job count over the set last several years. And last year, you can see the dip again, and that was not, uh, that was intentional. We have tried to encourage companies that are not paying what we consider reasonable wages, $20 an hour or more, to go somewhere else. It's, you know, we don't need to bring in three, four, five hundred job companies that are just competing for low-wage jobs when the reality is we, as a community, need those higher-paying jobs now more than ever. Just some of the projects that um, landed here in the county the last year, the top three in county alone, obviously the two cities are in the county as well. New Dean Tronics um, was a fantastic announcement just recently, 200 jobs, you know, 60, 70 thousand dollars a year, and uh, not just a advanced manufacturing facility, which is a focus of EDON, but a medical device manufacturer with an R&D component and uh, an incubator as well. So pretty exciting the kinds of companies we're starting to see more and more of. And then just some of the other companies in here and you can see the wages there. This is pretty exciting. Uh, yes, there are still people that are not employed, but there are certainly opportunities now more than ever to get everyone that with a little bit of training could fit into some of the jobs that have come to our region. Our unemployment is considered full. We're below 4% now. Um, and that's a transitional number. The reality is we continue to gain and lose jobs, so bringing in the higher paying jobs will help everyone. It's not slowing down. You can see these are some of the projects we're working with. We still have about 150 companies we're working with on a regular basis. Some are getting very close to a decision. You can see the job counts there. Smaller numbers than in the past in some ways. Um, you know, we have a large manufacturer, but generally we're shooting for the you know, 100 to 200 high paying jobs like the new Detronics land that we had recently. But manufacturing, advanced manufacturing has become our staple. And we are in fact becoming a manufacturing hub, which is great because in the advanced manufacturing world of the 21st century, those are 60 to 80,000 hour a year jobs. A lot of people are waiting for the bubble to burst. They've been waiting for a long time. Uh, you can see the trend line we projected about 50,000 new jobs in five years. People said that's not possible. Uh, we will be uh, breaking through the trend line here before the end of the year. And we, we projected a taper off uh, four years ago. Uh, there are indications that we will not taper off quite as much as we have planned, so we probably will continue on our current trend. What's exciting is you see the average wage in 2016 of the companies we worked with at 36,000, 2017, 46,000. 2017, 46, 28, we were up to, or 2018, we're up to over 50,000. That's for the average wage of jobs. Our goal for this coming year is 55,000. So we keep trying to push up those average wages so people have a living wage in our community. And attraction priorities remain advanced manufacturing, again, robotics, software development, coders, things that are very much a part of the manufacturing ecosystem now. Uh, higher paying jobs, corporate headquarters, technology companies really pushing for more technology. That's a great opportunity for us. It ties in with our entrepreneurial efforts and the Bay Area right now is, is looking for a place to move to and a lot of those companies are now considering this region. A lot of people think the growth is extreme but if you look back 17 years and forward 17 years, it's pretty much the same. So yeah, we've had our highs and lows over the last 17 years. We expect the same kind of thing as we go through the next 17 years based on our estimates, but it's not unusual, it's not extreme, it's growth that we've experienced in the past, it's just coming off this recession, it seems to be a little bit more dramatic than what people expect. A lot of the companies we work with land in the city of Reno, 
Uh, Story County only gets 17 percent. A lot of people say all the growth is out there. Obviously, the community at large is growing as well. And then Washington County has their own little slice in there, in addition to being, obviously, uh, the municipality where the Sparks and Reno reside. If you talk about attraction, things are going really well, and we're tapering our program to bring in the, the great kinds of jobs we need going forward. But we need to keep the companies here, and that's really what the retention effort is about. We visit companies. We support companies. Clearly, workforce development and attraction are now one of their top concerns. But they have other concerns we work with them on on as well. We visit them, we uh, help them connect, we encourage them to do more sustainable activities. There are things we can do to help the companies that are here be more, um, more effective and more successful. On the workforce side, we want to help the workforce stay here. We want to help develop programs and we're working with state and our local education institutions on the training, workforce development. In fact, uh, we're encouraging the state to put even more funding into workforce development going forward. And then we connect. There's a lot of organizations working in the workforce area. We help them connect as well. And if you look at uh, entrepreneurial side, that part where you have a startup that will potentially be the next Tesla or the next great company, if we can get that startup to grow here, what a huge opportunity. And that really is what the entrepreneurial focus of the organization is about. We had 49 new companies last year. 182 do jobs doesn't sound like much, but one of the two company, one of the companies we brought in two years ago at two companies is now at 60 and they're paying $100,000 a year. So most of the entrepreneurial jobs are higher paying and are in the technology space. Some of the programs we support, it's all about startups and helping startups connect, help, helping startups find their funding. And then some of the companies we help to attract and organically grow in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Finally, the, uh, the uh, community development piece, we do get involved in community initiatives that we think will have an impact on our ability to attract and retain quality jobs in the years ahead. The funding for the school infrastructure, WC1, was one of them, obviously. Uh, with the schools we had average age 50 years old with no funding to repair and maintain them. That initiative certainly was an important one. We got involved and helped lead that through to success. Our schools will now be state of the art as we continue to upgrade them. Downtown revitalization, arts and culture. Uh, the city manager gave a great presentation at the arts and culture business and arts event recently about the art trail and what you're doing to support arts and culture. That's a part of our community that's incredibly important, uh, undervalued in many ways, but something that's attractive to the talent looking at our region. So we're working on things like that, on trails, uh, regional flood control is an initiative we pushed forward on now. Uh, the WC1 initiative, we, working through that process and just getting a report from Brian Bonifant, it's gonna cost about $2.5 billion to address damage that occurred if we had similar damage that we did in 19, 97 flood, $2.5 billion. It will cost the community $200 million to fix the problem forever. And that's what WC1, the Stop River Flooding Initiative does. A fairly inexpensive solution to a very expensive problem, especially considering we could get multiple floods, certainly in our lifetime. And again, I want to thank the commissioners, the staff. You're an important part of our team, and uh, we we open it up for any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Kazmierski. We appreciate you being here. As always, good information and so exciting. And uh, as I indicated once before, a little scary with all of this type of growth going on and all the things that go along with growth. And so we appreciate you being here. Commissioners, any comments, questions? So thank you very much. Appreciate thank you your being here. Have a good day. All right, Mr. Manager, we're back to uh, item five. <clears throat> item five is Commissioner County Manager's announcements, reports, and updates, requests for information or topics for future agendas. Uh, I would mention uh, related to, to, to today's agenda, uh, we do not need item 19. That's the possible closed session for labor discussions. We do not need that. And then I'd also mention, I'll mention this again on item 6E. Uh, there's been a request from the City of Reno to make a, a change to the list of parcels. Um, they are asking uh, that 
And I'll, I'll, you know what, I'll, when we get to that item, I'll, I'll talk about the specifics okay. of that. Thank you. Commissioner Herman? Is that on? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> My voice is kind of scratchy today, but um, I just wanted to bring up a little um, plea that I have for um, item 6E. Um, sometimes when we have these properties come up due to people not paying their taxes or dying or whatever happens to get them there, um, they just kind of disappear. And so I, I was wanting to ask that we try really hard to have fair sales of these properties so that they get back into the private sector and then we have them on the tax rolls, which really does help us. So that, that was one of the main things I had to say. And in regards to um, the people that were here about Quartz Lane, that is a disaster. That's a true disaster area. If you want to go see something that looks like a bomb hit it, just go there. Yeah, just drive up Quartz Lane. It's right where the fire station is on Sun Valley Drive. Turn left and just keep going. And, and definitely this needs a fix. And I think that it's our job and responsibility to try and do something about this. Um, it's, uh, it's just like they said. Somebody's making a garbage dump out of it. So, And, and the danger is that um, there are people that live there that may or may not have health issues and may need an emergency vehicle. A, a fire could occur there. They could need the fire engine to get up there. And right now, trust me, you can't get a fire engine up there. So, and the waste management has to move stuff before they can get to, to pick up the garbage. So that's a problem. So yes, we need to do something about that, for sure. Um, and then on my nagging here about cabs. Yes, we need our regular cabs where people can know what's going on in their communities. That's just a shame that these things are happening and, and people aren't able to to speak on issues that they can't come here because they're working. They, they took off a day of work, they'd probably lose their job. So we sure don't want that. Um, there, I have a huge list, but I don't think my throat's gonna handle it right now. But anyhow, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Herman. What was that first item that you commented on? Which, what was the number you said? 6E. 6E? I believe so. Okay. It, okay. This, this, this here. Thanks. All right. Okay. Uh, com thank you, Commissioner Herman. Uh, Commissioner Hartung. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. Um, just people in Spanish Springs, the light at Calle de la Plata and Pyramid that we have been working on for many, many years is almost completed. And then the second phase of that is the uh, acceleration lane coming off of the Shawneva Road. Uh, that will go all the way to West Calle de la Plata. Um, Martin Marietta and Pyramid Materials both have agreed to enter into a 3P, a public-private partnership, and they are willing to put up um, the materials to have that, that acceleration done, which will make that stretch of Pyramid Highway much, much safer. Any, anyone who travels that, whether you're in... Um, um, Palomino or Winnemucca coming down through there when the trucks enter the highway there. It's a, it's a very dangerous situation. So um, uh, RTC and NDOT are working diligently and, and um, we are in the, the planning phases of that and that's the, that's the next step. So thank you, Madam Chair. Good. Thank you, Commissioner Herman. Um, I mean, Commissioner Hartung, sorry. Getting my H's confused here. Vice Chair Jung. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I wanted to let the board know that I went to the new uh, DMV groundbreaking oh, fun, <clears throat> last week, and um, that's way down in Southtown, but the governor made a really interesting point that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that really that is the center of Reno right now, down off Double R, and 
<clears throat> if you really look at our growth, that's probably the most appropriate place. So I thought that was interesting and um, well attended. And, and one of the partners that uh, Mr. Kazmierski mentioned uh, that was that is building that is uh, uh, Clark and Sullivan. And they are part of the conscious capitalism uh, movement here of really giving back to the community when they take these government jobs and making sure that they, there is a percentage that goes to whatever we need as a government, right? <clears throat> um, I do want to congratulate Commissioner Hartung about Cala de la Plata um, because that has been, go I've been on the board for over 11 years and your predecessor, Commissioner Larkin, was always um, concerned about that, but you never let it go. And you have a lot in common with Commissioner Weber, just so you know, in terms of when you get onto a project, doesn't matter how many no's, 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 you figure out a way to manage that. And so I give you full credit and credentials, and that's a great promise is kept for you. Um, big, big, big deal, especially since he was on the Citizens Advisory Board. So, so congratulations. They should name that the Von Hartung. Street. <laughs> um, I do want the manager, if he could just bring us back. I don't, I don't know if we need to have a, a hearing, but if you think that we do, I'm happy to do that too. Of this voter squatting, I've never heard of this before. And do we have a P.O. box, an address, something that a homeless person, because they have every right to vote. You don't have to own a house, live in a house to be able to exercise your right to vote. But to fictitiously say you live someplace does make people very anxious. And you know, this with the last uh, presidential election with some monkey in around that was going on either side, uh, I would like us to be very uh, aware of and, and, and to make sure that it is, it's, it, that every vote counts, but also that the, um, the, the process is transparent and there is a process. Um, I will be going to a Nevada Works meeting on Friday, just to let you know. And then, Mr. Manager, I don't know, Commissioner uh, Herman did not ask for an agenda item, and I don't know if we need an agenda item to go over the Quartz Lane issue. I worked on that many years ago when I first got into office, and it was the same situation, it's private property. Um, so maybe there's funds, Mr. Solaro, through CivGid or something, at least to do initial cleanup, and then, posting signs or educating people, fining people, you know, having the sheriff sit up there and wait and, you know, give the people a, a ticket for dumping, but it's not getting better. It seems like it's getting worse. So that's up to staff's discretion. Either bring it back as an agenda item or please brief the whole commission as to what the next steps is, because that's not, the, Quartz Lane is not the only situation like that in all of the county. There's lots of Quartz Lanes out there, so it'd be nice to have a template on how we deal with that moving forward. And that is all I have. Thank you. Madam Chair. Um, with regard to the Quartz Lane property, the clerk's office received a complaint yesterday from some property owners out there, and it's pursuant to a particular statute which requires that I bring it to you and then you hear it within a certain time frame. So I'll be working diligently to get that on your agenda and so you can set the hearing, but we only have 30 to 40 days to do it all. But we did get a written complaint. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, I do think that's an area that we have great concern about, not just because clearly it's private land that people are dumping stuff on, but I am concerned that there's a serious fire danger out here. And so I would, I agree, I would like to see something on that fairly soon. And I also, this thing uh, the, with Don, Mr. Folsom and the voters, that's just, Crazy, and I noticed that ACM Kate Thomas um, went over and spoke with him, so I appreciate that she immediately jumped on it, and I know that staff will be looking at it, but that is a, something that's of grave concern to all of us. Um, okay, Commissioner, or, or Mr. Manager. So, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In regard to Mr. Fossum's um, public comment, I, I've sent information to the voter registrar already re reflecting what he was speaking to, and, and perhaps, just as we did just prior to the primary, perhaps we can have uh, Deanna Spicula come and just give us an update just before, you know, before the election on, on um, preparations as well as other issues that, that she may be able to speak to. Okay, you know, the thing that concerns me about that is I, I know that if there are four or five people voting for him in the same house who don't have the same last name, there could be questions presented and maybe the real voter doesn't get to vote or, you know, I just, I just think there's potential, really potential problems here and that concerns me. 
So we'll have uh, uh, that probably would have to be on the 23rd then to get Deanna Spicula here to just to speak to preparations and then that to be able to answer some questions. Okay. Commissioner Hartung? Um, and, and that was exactly my question, Madam Chair, was how do you know when multiple people are registered at the same address that don't have the same last name um, if, if, it's, if it's genuine? How do, how do we, you know, what, what uh, stopgap do we have in place to mm -hmm. ensure that they actually reside there? Yeah, good question. And, and, and you know, and that's, that goes to um, a question that will be on our ballot with respect to the DMV actually registering you to vote where they, they do try to verify your legal address. So mm -hmm. that's a, there's possibly some interesting correlations there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hartung. Commissioner Herman. Okay, um, I brought this issue up a few months back, actually, and um, I had several different people that had their addresses, and their mail came in my mailbox. I recall that, yeah. And so I checked the records and I found that this one lady had, had five different addresses in the county. So how many times has she voted? Oh, yeah, break. that's really good. That kind of thing is very scary and it's certainly something that needs to be looked into. So thank you for bringing it to our attention. I thought that was addressed when you brought it up the last time. Um, so, um, but obviously we're still dealing with the same type of problem. So anything else? Yes, Mr. Manager. Oh, come, sorry, Vice Chair I would be remiss and um, Adam Mayberry would be not happy with us if we didn't mention that on Saturday, October 13th, our, uh, our uh, open house, Truckee Meadows Fire Protection District open houses from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Station 17 in Spanish Springs will have one. Station 15 on, in Sun Valley will have one. Station 14 at Foothill, our brand new station at Foothill Road will have one. And Station 35, our second most brand new station on West 4th Street, will be having one. And there's prizes, and you can win a, a ash can and uh, Carbon, carbon monoxide detectors, fire detectors. So we really encourage, and there, of course, there'll be food and drinks, and I'm sure your commissioners will be there as well. So I encourage everybody to come out and see what a great group we have of firefighters for Truckee Meadows Fire Protection District. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Jung. Commissioner Hartung? Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Commissioner Jung, I would remind you that uh, everyone will win an ash can. <laughs> they, are, they are free uh, to anyone who asks whether you reside uh, in the unincorporated, it, it, everybody is a county resident as far as we're concerned, and ash cans prevent fires. So that's, a, that's been a great, very successful program. Um, maybe they have a special ash can to give away, uh, but, but they, are, they are available to anyone and everyone at all times, and I'll make sure that, that we are, are stocked up. Thank you. Um, Mr. Manager, I just thought of one other thing. I'm, I'm a little concerned about uh, Ms. Snediger's comment about somebody building three homes and then building three homes and then building three homes. I, I, could, could we get a, Mr. Solero, would you please look into that for us? I, I, already, I, I already on top of it as already. normal. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Because that's a little disconcerting that someone is um, sidestepping our rules by playing games. And thank you, Ms. Snedeker, for bringing it to our attention. And with that, anything else, commissioners? Mr. Manager? All right, we will move on. We will close five and move on to the consent agenda. Your consent agenda today is item six, represented through 6A1 through 6F. Um, and one note that I wanted to make, I mentioned earlier on item 6E. Uh, this is the uh, treasurer's item on auction of delinquent lands. The city of Reno has asked that one of the parcels that they had previously asked be set aside for them be placed back on the list. Uh, and that, just for the record, the parcel number um, that is going back is 162-082-02. Um, and to Commissioner Herman's, perhaps to Commissioner Herman's question or concern earlier, there are, and, there are now 102 total uh, parcels listed uh, with four of those being held, being requested uh, by government, by public agencies um, for public use, um, two for open space, and two for street use by the city of Reno. Thank you, Mr. Manager. <clears throat> Anybody else have any comments uh, 
on uh, the consent agenda? Any changes? Okay, I am. Um, do we have any public? Com yes, Commissioner Hartung. Chair, um, Mr. Manager, when will we bring back um, the public guardian position? Thank you for asking that question. Um, uh, so uh, Susan DeBoer, our, um, who is now our, our former public guardian, she is retired. Um, and today's item is uh, the interim appointment of Kate Thomas as interim public guardian. We have begun, to do. we have started the recruitment process. Um, that process is outlined in county code. Um, uh, at, at the end of the recruitment process, the county manager makes a recommendation to the board. Um, and so, um, I don't have the timetable, exact timetable, but what we've started that recruitment process. So and, it may and be the a few reason, months. And the reason I, I ask this is I was just uh, teasing ACM uh, Thomas that, that she has nothing else to do. There's nothing on her agenda. Uh, it's, it's completely free. It's been opened up. Um, and, and this is, and this is, a, this is a, an integral position. It, it, it requires a lot, Mr. Manager. So um, sooner rather than later, um, to, to bring that back. I, I know it's a process, but um, this, this speaks, um, as far as, as I can see, also to all of those key positions. How are we, you know, as we look at succession, how do we, how do we plan for this so that there is as little downtime as possible, but yet keeping it a fair and open, transparent process? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Ms. Thomas, for taking it on. It, it is, uh, this is, I bet this is gonna be a learning experience for you. Well, well, it's not on the block, so. Okay, good, thank you. Commissioner Hartung, anything else? No, thanks, Madam. Okay, would you erase him? You're still on my agenda, would you erase yourself? Thank you. All right, any other um, comments from anybody on anything on the consent agenda? I see no public comment. Do you, do you have anything, Madam Clerk? No, ma'am, we just need a motion. Okay. So I, moved. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, please affirm your vote above. Uh, the motion passes for nothing with Commissioner Lucy absent. And so we will move on, Mr. Manager. Uh, or oh, actually, let's go to a block vote. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and uh, Commissioners. I would like to place in the form of a motion a block vote of item number seven to reappoint Mr. Ainsworth and Ms. Barbara Bobby Lazzaroni, two terrific human beings in this community that have given more than they've ever taken back from us. So I'm happy to make that in a block. Item nine, 10, or I mean, I could give you two names and eight if you guys are open to it, or do you want me to just hold it out? Okay, <laughs> I want Lori Bomberger and Ray Cabish for block. So we wanna have a discussion? Okay, we'll have a discussion. Okay, so, we'll okay. so item seven, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 is my motion. It's totally up to you, Mr. Commissioner. No, 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 no. Microphone. Commissioner Hartung. Microphone, please. please. I'm sorry, please. forgive me. Um, I just think it's important for Ms. Howell to be recognized on her hard work on item 16. Yeah. And, and what, a, what a great thing this is for our community. And, I, and it's not, uh, Commissioner Jung, I'm not trying to overstep a boundary. I agree, it, it is, it, it, it's a formality that it has to be here because this is such a great thing. But I think it's important that we give Ms. Howell at least an opportunity to tell us some of the things that she's done and she's completed because she has worked really hard on I this. I agree. And, that was an oversight. I'm sorry. And, and she has blisters on her hands <laughs> from yanking and on her the feet. rope. And her feet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's she's done a, a fabulous job. Yeah, she so certainly I, legitimized us with the I, state of Nevada I, and the I, governor I really, and Mr. Really, Wilden and I, I think I think let's I think, pull that one out thank, and we'll have her do a presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry for the oversight, Ms. Howe. Thanks. Thanks. No problem. So let's go back. That is seven Eight, or seven, nine, 10, yep. 11, 12, Mr. Manager. I don't normally do this. I don't, on item 10, 10 mm -hmm. uh, we have a um, uh, couple of individuals here. Um, this is kind of a kickoff moment. Oh, um, that's right. Moment pull it out, product. sir. So pull it okay. out. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, good. So let's good go try. back and do that again. Madam Clerk, we have for a block vote seven, nine, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Correct. 
Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. Madam Chair. Mr. Liparelli. Uh, Commissioner Jung, in making the motion in reference to item number seven, mentioned the names of Mr. Ainsworth and Ms. Lazzaroni. Um, Ms. Uh, Crane or Crony is listed as an alternate. Sorry, guys, I, I got too to much sleep sure last night, so <laughs> I am I not on top make of sure things. That, uh, the yes, and a shout out to Miss Jamie Crone, who will serve as our alternate to the Washoe County Board of Equalization, which is not the easiest job either on the planet. Thank you, Mr. No. Lipperelli. Thank you, and Mr. Manager, did you have something else? No, ready to okay. read. All right. Ready for me to read those? Uh, yes, please. Okay, item seven is a recommendation to, to reappoint Mr. James Ain Ainsworth and Ms. Barbara Bobby Lazzaroni as regular members to serve on the Washington County Board of Equalization with a term to expire June 30, 2020, and Ms. Cramy Jamie Craney as an alternate to serve on the Washington County Board of Equalization with a term to expire on June 30, 2019. Item nine is a recommendation to award Washoe County bid number 3049-18 and approve the mosquito abatement products for the Environmental Health Services Division of the Washoe County Health District. On a multiple award basis, Adapco, Clark Mosquito Control Products, Valent Biosciences, and Rintokio Kill North America, all four responsive responsible bidders were, were, were awarded various bid items based on lowest cost pricing and or rebates offered. Where prices from bidders were equal, Adapco Incorporated was awarded the bid on the basis that they were the only supplier to offer a rebate in their bid documentation. This award recommendation is made on a requirement base, requirements basis within the with an adopted annual base budget of $231,500. The term of the award shall be from the date of a bid approval through December 31, 2021, with the county retaining the option for a one-year extension. Item 11 is a request by the county manager through the Washington County Clerk and pursuant to Washington County Code 2.030 to initiate amendments to the Washington County Code, chapters 5, 15 and 65, and to direct the county clerk to submit the request to the district attorney's office for preparation of proposed ordinances in accordance with WC Washoe County Code 2.040. Item 12 is recommendation to acknowledge the grant awards from the State of Nevada Administrative Office of the Courts to the Second Judicial District Court in the amount of $180,345, no county match required, to support the medication assisted treatment court. And in the amount of $50,991, no county match required to support the Youth Offender Diversion Court, effective retroactively to July 1, 2018 through June 30, 2019. No base adjustments are necessary as this award was anticipated and accounted for during the budget process for fiscal year 2019. Item 13 is a recommendation to approve the reimbursements of costs incurred by the City of Reno, the City of Sparks, and the Departments of Washoe County for expenses related to and in support of the enhanced 911 emergency response system and approved by the 911 approved by the 911 committee in an amount not to exceed $2,945,612 for fiscal year 2018-2019 as specified within the adopted enhanced 911 funds operating budget. Item 14 is a recommendation to approve the purchase of one 3,500 XL genetic analyzer from Thermo Fisher Scientific at a cost of $180,476.85 using $158,340 from the 2016 Capacity Enhancement Backlog Reduction DNA Grant and $22,136.85 from the restricted funding set up for DNA offender mandates. Uh, and this is a sole source purchasing exemption. And Item 15 is recommendation to approve amendment number four to the agreement of, for child protection facility operator at the kids cottage retroactive to July 1, 2018 to, Ju to February 28, 2019 with Adams and Associates in an amount not to exceed $1,900,000 and authorize the purchasing contracts manager to sign the agreement. That is all. Thank you, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any public comment? And not on those block items, Madam Chair. Okay. Just under discussion, Madam Chair, I'd yes, just sir. like to note that we do have a member of the forensics lab here, and, and uh, we're, we're proud to support this. They, they do such a great job for our community. They, yes, they really, do. They really do a bang up job. And, uh, and, and anytime we can uh, support these kinds of, of pieces of equipment, um, I'm, I mean, I'm all for it, so thank you. Good, thank you, Commissioner Hartung, good point. All right, so we have a motion and a second and we have no public comment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Please cast your vote on the screen and then affirm your vote above.
Commissioner Jung, would you like me to? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Motion passes for nothing with Commissioner Lucy absent. Thank you very much, everybody. And Mr. Manager, I guess that moves us to number eight. Item eight is a recommendation to appoint two candidates from a pool of applicants, including Lori Bomberger, Anthony Demo, Ray Cabish, Joe Kircher, and Jim Ray, to fill the two vacant seats on the Washington County Advisory Board to manage wildlife with a term effective October 10, 2018 through June 2021. Okay, Commissioner Herman. Speaker. Microphone, please. Uh, okay. Is it now? There, now it's on. Okay. It wasn't close enough, I guess. Um, Anthony Demo. I'm sorry, who? Anthony Demo. Okay, you're interested in Anthony Demo. And there, you, we need two, so did you have a second no, choice? No, I just had the one. Okay, um, Commissioner Hartung? Well, my, my two are, and, and these are people that I know that have been involved for quite some time, and I've had some conversations with folks who are, are very involved with this, and that's uh, Mr. Ray Cabish and Jim Ray. Okay, Vice Chair Jung? I would like Lori Baumberger, and I'm gonna go with Commissioner Herman with Anthony Demo. Okay. Um, Okay, and we do have a public comment, Mr. Rex Flowers. Good Welcome, morning. Mr. Flowers. Good morning. My name is Rex Flowers. I'm a past member of the cabinet uh, and have been involved with the Wildlife Commission as a uh, member of a number of their committees in the past. I'm currently serving as a director for the Coalition for Nevada's Wildlife. I am speaking to you on my own behalf. I'm not representing anyone. Um, I would hope the last time we had these selections was two years ago, and my hat's off to Mr. Hartung, Commissioner Hartung. He voted no at that time. I said at that time, you really need to give consideration to those individuals who are involved in wildlife and the NGOs that support wildlife. This isn't about giving our personal friends a position on a cab. It's not about uh, uh, helping out somebody who has made political contributions to you. That mistake was made the last time. Things are starting to come around a little bit now on the current cab. Uh, however, Washoe County has lost all its representation at the state level because there's been no commitment for anybody to attend those commission meetings. Those, are, those meetings, they are budgeted to attend. And according to NRS 501.303, they are to attend, but that's not being done. We do have on, on these five individuals, Ray Cabish, he has been attending the county meetings and he has been to several commission meetings. He is dedicated to it. He's a member of a number of NGOs. Um, last time he was overlooked, I would hope this time that wouldn't happen. The other individual, Jim Ray, is a longtime sportsman and wildlife advocate. He's not in this for anything other than wildlife. Um, I believe he is committed to attending and help bring Washoe County back to that table. And uh, so I would hope that you would go with Mr. Hartung's recommendations of those two individuals. It would be a, a blessing for Washoe County and Washoe County's wildlife. Thank you. Microphone, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Flowers. I definitely have Mr. Cabish on. Um, I really don't, uh, for the record, I really don't know any of these people really well. I know, I've read their reviews and I know of them, but <clears throat> I don't know them well, so I can't say, well, this guy's better than that guy. But I do mis know Mr. Ray Cabish and I know that he's been good. And so that would say that between my vote and um, Commissioner Hartung's vote, that would put be two for him and then two for Anthony. 
um, uh, demo. So if that's acceptable to everybody, um, that's two commissioners for each of those two. Those would be the two that I think we put on there. Well, Commissioner and, Hartung. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I and um, I'm going to be 100% honest. I've I've only researched these people and talked to others who know that they're involved. And involvement is the key. It, it's you know it's no different than any other process where if you if you don't attend regularly, if you're not there all the time, you don't know what has happened historically. Um, and the reason that I've picked these two is because I have talked to people who who know that these fellows are involved, and and so um, I would respectfully ask the commission to let's not overlook these folks. This is an important board. Wildlife is an important scenario, um, and and let's put the people on there that we know are going to stay involved and, and that are involved. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hartung, Vice Chair Jung. <clears throat> well, I don't, I don't know any of these people whatsoever. I just went on reading their application. Um, so that leaves me at that position. But I think it's a nice um, balance if we go with Mr. Demo and Mr. Cabish, because I know Mr. Ray and Mr. Cabish were both um, nominated by, these, by the board itself. So I like one from the inside, and I'm okay with one from the outside. I, my, I, my decision stands. I'm sorry. Commissioner Herman. No, I think the can way we, it is. No, I mean, can we can we vote for for each member individually, Mr. Liparelli? Uh, Madam Chair, for the commission, you can use any process you want as long as it's open. No, there can't be any um, secret ballot. Oh, come on. <laughs> Think how much fun secret ballots would be. <laughs> All right, well, um, com uh, so Commissioner Harton has asked for a vote on each one individually. Commissioner well, Vice Chair I mean, of, of those that have been nominated, and the ones that have been nominated have been Demo, Cabish, Ray, and Bomberger. Okay. Do you want to read those? No, 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 no. I just think we should we should vote on them on them individually, so that so that it's on the record of who we supported and, and who we didn't support. That's it's just a, just exactly okay. just. Just simple. Okay, let's do a recap then. Uh, Commissioner. For the, for the two. Okay, Commissioner Herman. So um, I suggested Anthony Demo, and I, if we're going to pick two, or are we going to just pick one? Two? Well. Okay, Caddish then. Okay. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Herman. Commissioner Hartung? Uh, it's Cabish and Ray. All right. Um, uh, and Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Jung? Demo and Cabish. Okay, and my two choices are um, Cabish and Demo. Okay. So we have three and three. There you go. It's so Demo there's, and Cabbage. it's on the record. So, yep. um, can, okay. I would like to make a motion, Madam Chairwoman, yes, to please. appoint um, Mr. Anthony Demo and Mr. Ray Cabish, and to thank everybody who applied and put mm -hmm. in the hard work and we will be watching and we have your advocate here you best make your meetings thank you second <laughs> i have a motion and a second under discussion madam chair yes i will Hartung. support the motion because we went through the process of okay. the nomination and Absolutely. i will support the board's movement thank you very much all those in do we have any public comment in, oh we already did that um so uh, all those in favor of the motion as uh dic dictated um signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. Please cast your vote on the screen and affirm your vote above. Motion passes for nothing with Commissioner Lucy absent. Mr. Manager, I think we're to 10. We are at item 10. We, we are at item 10. Uh, and this is a recommendation to authorize the county manager to work with Foundation Forward to pursue the funding installation of a Charters of Freedom educational project adjacent to the historic courthouse. And uh, Kate Thomas is here to introduce this item. I would, I would just mention before she does that, um, I've been aware of this effort for, for a number of years now, and I'm very excited that we've, we're, we're, we're kicking this off. So I'll turn to Kate Thomas. 
Thank you, Mr. Manager and uh, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. I am excited to be working on this project. We were approached, as Manager Slaughter said a while ago, from these two very driven gentlemen in the community who are committed to helping us put together the Charters of Freedom installation at the historic courthouse in downtown. Um, so I'm not going to take up a bunch of time, but I'd like to bring forward Chuck Slavin and Mike Widmer to talk a little bit about their project <coughs> and kick us off on this. Thank you very much. Before they get going, Madam Chair, we did receive a pamphlet for the record, which yes. I will make part of the record. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Well, Thank you. My name is Chuck Slavin. I'm here with my partner in this project, Mike Widmer. We're associated with Foundation Ford, which is an educational nonprofit whose sole mission is to bring our nation's founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights to communities around the United States. The original of these documents, collectively known as the Charters of Freedom, are on permanent display at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. I have a short, I think about a three minute video I'd like to show you that describes a little bit more about the foundation and the Charters of Freedom documents. <coughs> Unfortunately, a lot of people uh, don't get to go to Washington, D.C. and see our founding documents. So many people that I talk to don't know what the Charters of Freedom are. When we explain, they say, oh, yeah, 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 I've, I've heard about those. It's very important that the students not only know about the history, but why they should have pride in these documents. Back in 2011, my wife and I were up in Washington, D.C., visiting with some congressmen and some of the organizations up there. We had some free time, so we decided to go over to the National Archives. You walk through these big bronze gates into this rotunda, and there are the founding documents over on the other side of the room. These are known as your charters of freedom. The first time I saw the Declaration of Independence, something our founding fathers had actually penned, and saw their signatures, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Rutledge, and the others, I just got goosebumps. I remember the thought came to me, what if I could duplicate the experience I had up in Washington? The first time we saw the Charters of Freedom, what if I could bring that experience back to the citizens of Burke County? Then, on July 2nd, 2014, we dedicated the first Charters of Freedom monument outside of Washington, D.C. From an educational standpoint, for our children to actually see it within their home counties, be able to touch it, feel it, and view it, it's a huge deal for veterans uh, as well as for our children. Imagine, if you will, third and fourth grade school teachers bringing their classes here for annual field trips to learn a little about the documents, a little about our government, our founding fathers, and also about state and local history while they're here. I think with the educational system, teachers and educators are sometimes limited by the materials and just time. So to be able to provide teachers with the educational materials that they can use to kind of focus their visits to these sites, that's exciting to me. When they talk of their charters of freedom in their hometown, remembering that their fourth grade school teacher took them down and taught them about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence. We're in the beginning of what could be a massive re-education of our founding principles. Our goal as a foundation is to set monuments in as many communities as possible over the next nine years to provide access to our founding documents in the communities so the children and people of these communities don't have to go all the way to Washington, D.C. to experience these documents in a proper setting. But they will no longer talk about the Constitution and Bill of Rights in Washington. They'll be talking about their Constitution and their Bill of Rights, the ones they grew up with right in their home community. Great, beautiful, uh, that was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, the proposed location for this setting is the old courthouse on Virginia Street across from the Pioneer Theater. We think it's a great location, good visibility, high traffic, uh, and fitting that it's associated with the old courthouse. Um, Mike Widmer has a couple words he can say about 
what we plan to do to raise the necessary funds. Good morning, commissioners. You'll see on the screen our uh, take on the uh, rendering of what this would look like at the Washoe County site. Our, we intend to raise $70,000. We think it'll happen fairly quickly, you know, easily within a year's time. That some of the funding can be in-kind services. And so my uh, intention is to go to as many service organizations as possible to uh, give a presentation much like we are here today. And I, we have, Chuck and I have uh, no doubt that this will be funded and we can get this thing constructed for our current generations and future. So if there's any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you very much. You know, the, that's one of my favorite things about going to DC is to see the, to, to go see the declaration and all the other items like that. Oh my gosh, it was so wonderful. I really enjoyed it. But I, I've been to DC many, many times and, the, and, and I rarely fail to get to the museum to see all of the documents and so it's wonderful. Commissioners, any comments? Vice Chair Jung. I just want to thank you so much for bringing this out here and giving all of the young people and the more wise people of our community the opportunity to see um, the founding papers of who we are. And, you know, we're such a young country. I think sometimes we forget how important our history is. We, we, um, and we especially don't show our children as much how important it is because we are very young. So I think you have a righteous goal. And any way I can help you with raising money, I am happy to help. Well, I appreciate that. We're, we're excited to bring this to Washoe County. And with regard to any way you can help, we're novices at fundraising. So any groups or organizations that you think we should visit with, we'd be delighted. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks, Ms. Thomas, for bringing this forward. Oh, Vice Chair uh, Har Hartung. <laughs> Vice Chair Hartung. <laughs> Thank you for the, the, the promotion, but no. Uh, Mr. Slavin, are you related to Pat Slavin? I am indeed. How? Or at least a Pat Slavin. You a, worked at TMCC. Uh, one and the same. Yes. I've known Pat for, gosh, before I was married. Um, that 30, long? 30 hundreds. <laughs> I was something before electricity. Um, <laughs> Tell Pat I said hello. She's a I should, well, I should have said that she's my wife. She's yes. a very she's yeah. a very dear friend. Yes. And and yeah. so my supervisor. <laughs> yeah, your supervisor, that's right. <laughs> I I understand this. Uh, having been married 34 years. So um, anything that we can do to help, I mean this is this is such a, a notable cause uh, and a worthwhile cause. Um, it, it is it is so very important to the very foundation of, of what we do. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know how we can help, but um, I'm, I'd be pleased to assist in any way. Appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank Chair. you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Do, Mr. Manager, do we need to take a vote accepting this? OK, we have a motion and a second. All those in, and do we have public comment? I don't see any. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, please opposed. Uh, please cast your vote on the screen and affirm your vote above. Motion passes three to nothing with both Commissioner Hartung, I'm sorry, <laughs> Commissioner Herman and Commissioner Lucy absent. So, um, okay, Mr. Manager, we'll move on. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Thank you, you Madam Chair. Our next item is item 16. Uh, this is a recommendation to approve an interlocal lease contract between Washoe County and the state of Nevada by and through its Department of Health and Human Services to lease property located at the Northern Nevada Adult Mental Health Services campus for uh, Washoe County programs that serve Northern Nevada's vulnerable populations. Uh, there is no lease cost to Washoe County. Maintenance and service related costs are approximately $717,338 annually. Um, Ms. Amber Howell is here. Uh, Madam Chair, this is, I, in my mind, this is, there's moments in time when in, our, in our work on um, homeless uh, issues. There are moments in time when we need to pause and say this is very significant and this is one of those times. Absolutely. 
Thank you, Ms. Howell, so much. And um, I know you have done yeoman's work on this, and I really appreciate everything you've done. Madam Chair, before she speaks, may I just may I just say something? Certainly. Um, um, Amber, you have done such a great job on this. As we spoke just privately a few minutes ago, and I will reveal uh, our, our conversation. Kevin Schiller started this, and he was and he was working on it. And then when you came on board, um, and Mr. Schiller left, you continued this this um, marathon. It has been a marathon, and you have done such a phenomenal job for us. Um, I am I'm just I'm so excited for all the great things that this is going to bring. So before you started, I'm sorry. I just I. I we know how hard Mr. Schiller worked, and there was um, a great deal of pushback from the state because the state at the time had wanted uh, some different things to happen with the campus. And and, um, um, and then we got an intelligent woman on the job, so. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> I have nothing more to say, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Howell, please. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I wanted to go through what this lease actually does. We won't get into the programmatic aspects of it. That'll come at an, a later time. But I do want to go over a couple of slides of how this is really um, going to benefit us and what we are planning on doing. So first, I just want to talk a little bit about the current structure. As many of you know, the uh, emergency shelter is located on Record Street. The, it's comprised of a men's shelter, a women's shelter, there is an overflow aspect that's off-site, and then there's a family maternity shelter that's also on that campus. So you have a number of people located in a one-block radius. And so this is where it's located at, um, which many of you are very familiar with. This is actually the playground area for the, for the children where they go. I'll talk a little bit more about how we can enhance these areas uh, for, for children who end up in an emergency shelter situation. So I'm going to skip through to just go through some of the demographics so you understand and have the knowledge about the number of people um, that are frequenting the shelter. So last year, there was over 2,600 individuals who spent at least one night in the emergency shelter. And one of the areas of focus for HSA specifically is the number of children that spent at least one night in the shelter, and that's 275 unduplicated children that have spent the night. And something a little more of interest to HSA is that 42% of them were under the age of five. And so we've looked at that number and those demographics and started thinking about ways that we can provide an environment it's a little more kid friendly um, and gives us a little more space, which is what we set out to do. This is the increase in the households uh, served at the shelter. You, you will see a 60% increase um, in the residents that have frequented the shelter. So we are growing um, at, at mock speed and we have a little, very little space um, at the overflow or at the CAC, which, uh, which makes and forces the city of Reno and Washoe County and the city of Sparks to look for overflow locations, other tents to put up, and so we continue to build and um, put up uh, additional tents and beds uh, because of the limited space at the shelter. So what um, we started to do, this actually started in April. We started meeting with the state and looking at some of the opportunities that would be available to us. The original plan was to look at the NAMS campus and do a um, men's shelter on a six acre parcel up by the Lakes Crossing facility because of um, the overflowing capacity at Record Street. Washoe County started exploring a different alternative that would allow us to use current buildings in the community that are underutilized and need some significant rehab. So we started exploring and touring this site about 30 times, um, trying to do our data analysis of who are the individuals at the CAC and what we could do differently to provide more space. 
So what's in front of you is the NAMS parcel map, and the buildings that are in that are squared out is actually the buildings that are slated in the lease that's before you today. I'll highlight a couple of the areas. Those of you um, on this commission know that Riverhouse and TADS are already up and running. Those are crossroads facilities. But what will be new is there are cottages up on the north side, three cottages, that's going to allow us to double the number of women's crossroads clients that we will be able to serve, 100% double it, um, because our only other facility is at River House, and we have a small house off of Acacia. So we took the opportunity to look at how we could expand crossroads at the same time as finding some more land for the homeless population. We then looked at a couple of other buildings, so you'll notice the homeless families and homeless women would be relocated from the Record Street shelter uh, to this location instead. And then along with that, there is a portion of the CAC shelter that is for postpartum, so women who just had infants, and they are also located on the Record Street campus. So this gives us a nice um, amount of space, not only to provide more targeted programming for them, uh, but it also allows us to expand in certain areas. So rather than having six postpartum beds, we will be able to have 12. And rather than have 50 families, we might be able to extend that up to 75. So this campus allows us to grow and be a little more flexible with the census at any given time, especially in the winter months. But at the same time that we had the opportunity and we're meeting with the governor's office, we looked at one of the areas on the senior side that we were having difficulty finding funding and a location for our daybreak program. And we happened to find a, um, a building, uh, it says enliven up there, senior daybreak. And the building is absolutely perfect um, for our daybreak program. And what this will do is it will allow Washoe County HSA to triple the amount of clients that can be served by the day break program. Right, we will have about 100 in that facility. And so we really took the opportunity when we looked at the campus not only to try and address some of the influx in, in homeless clients, but also what other gaps do we have within HSA that we want to target some of these buildings for. And Daybreak is a perfect example of us doing that. Finally, at the last month, there is a building, 601, that says Home IL Homeless Youth. This wasn't originally on the design, but we have received some donations that may allow us to expand this program as well. And that surrounds the independent living homeless youth problem that we have in Washoe County. This would allow about 50 individuals to be within that building. So what we have done is we know that a lot of the youth homeless um, residents don't like to frequent the shelter. Um, it's different programming for them. And so this allows all of the different populations to be have a more targeted programmatic uh, approach rather than having everybody congregate in one campus in a very small block. So what you have before you is a lease that is no cost to Washoe County, not even a dollar. So Dave saves like $8 a year um, for these buildings, um, but um, no cost. Uh, to us, and one of the biggest hurdles we had was trying to get some consensus at the state level of trusting Washoe County to do this. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that the governor's office and Mike Wilden and Richard Whitley have given us so much trust and compassion over this population, and from day one have said, we wanna help how can we help you? We have these buildings, give us a proposal, something we can believe in and something that makes sense so that we can um, utilize this campus for a bigger purpose. So that's what the lease does for Washoe County. The next steps will be, it has to go in front of the Board of Examiners on November 13th, that is the final vote. It has gone in front of the CHAB Board with a, unan a unanimous vote. There was a couple other things that we had to do. 
Um, first, Dave Solero is my hero. Um, I have never seen a department reach out to the programmatic department and say, I don't know all the complexities, but I want to help. And to be there from day one is so amazing to me. Um, and what he has done to help me accomplish this, I will never be able to repay him. He has been absolutely amazing. Um, we had to find over $700,000 in our current budget for the operating and maintenance of this campus, which we successfully accomplished. And we are now working with the city of Reno to figure out which, po which populations start migrating over. I want to end with this is not a solution to the homeless problem. This is a foundation to build from. We believe that separating populations and having more intensive targeted case management helps people improve their lives. And we can't do that when they're all congregating in a very small block. There's just not enough room for them to relax and focus on themselves. And this allows us to have more space it brings a significant amount of security to the campus. And then we will have a staffing plan that will come in front of you of how we will start addressing this from a programmatic standpoint. Because it's really not just the building. It's how are we going to serve them differently to, to change the dial for them. Um, and so that's really what this lease is, is achieving, is trying to achieve, is just to give us more space um, and a little bit of pause so that we have more room to have a more targeted approach to these populations, hoping that the clients in one of the shelter buildings will migrate into the Crossroads program so we have a seamless pipeline. And this allows us a lot of um, synergy to be able to do that. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, but th that's a little explanation of what the lease is that you have in front of you today. Ms. Howell, you did not point out the daycare Facility. Right, I did not, and I said that I would. Um, the daycare is the building that says SRC Homeless Shelter Learning Center. So what this building is, is it will be isolated for daycare only. So each age group will have their own room that they can go to. They won't be all commingling, so an infant needs something different than an eight-year-old may need. Um, there's an outdoor area that's already enclosed off, so lots of privacy. People can't congregate around the area and there's a significant amount of curriculum and purchasing that is going into getting um, that center up and running. We have an opportunity with the state of Nevada. Um, the child care block grant has increased 86% in the last year. So Washoe County has um, gone after some of those funds, which helps us with subsidy slots so that families don't have to worry about payment for child care um, when they move into the daycare facility. We will also open up the facility for anyone after they leave the shelter. They can still drop their child off um, and they can access the shelters because we know how important early education um, and childcare is for kids. So that takes care of a very vulnerable population with very significant milestones that they need to meet. And we don't want them to have to worry about meeting those milestones. And so that building will serve that purpose. So wonderful. Thank you so much. Commissioner Hartung. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> as, you, as you know, Ms. Howell, um, daybreak has been, since day one for me, um, a, a, a challenge. And so I, I truly look forward to uh, seeing a new facility for it. Um, are we still moving forward with Nevada Senior Services with a, with a partnership with them? What we will have to do is we're looking at um, whether we have to do an RFP or okay. some type of contractual services with them. They helped us two years ago in a redesign of senior services yes. and have worked with them and toured their amazing facility. And so if we do the RFP route, um, you know, I hope that they apply um, for that. And we've done the fiscal analysis to show what revenue we would need to have to, um, to put Bring, bring that up to about a hundred. Okay, yeah, and, and that's, I mean, that's just so important. And I know uh, Madam's chair and vice chair were supposed to um, 
go down to visit Mr. Klein, and I don't know whether that was ever accomplished. I know schedules were somewhat difficult. A crazy. But I would, I would encourage both of you to go. Uh, <clears throat> if all three of us could go, I, I would, but you know, as you know, that would be a violation of the open meeting law. But, but Mr. Klein does such an amazing job. I mean, he, he really does. And, and he has been able to leverage so many outside dollars to accomplish what people said couldn't be accomplished. And so I, I sincerely hope that we will um, uh, have a, a relationship with them because I would, I, I would love to see exactly the same program that they have down there in this facility. Um, with, I mean, they have a chef and and they have art programs and I mean it's just it's truly amazing. So it is it is uh, it is worthy of of note. Um, Ms. Howell, regarding the the youth homeless, are we going to have any type of of training programs where we can where we can try to figure out how to get them off the street, train them for some skill set that that would uh, provide them the ability to get themselves out of of being homeless? That's the intent and the goal. Uh, I wouldn't say that HSA is the expert in this population. Understood. 50% um, of them are in foster care. The other 50% aren't. Um, there are experts in our community who do a very good job at this population. And so we, what we would look at for this facility is some type of contractual agreement um, with somebody who does a really good job okay. uh, with this population. But the idea is with the with the homeless youth and every individual that is homeless, the idea is for us to not keep them where they're at. It's, right. it's to, to stop the homeless cycle for them. And so we know that this only works with intensive wraparound and case management services, and we would do the very same for that population as well. I, I know how successful we've been with respect to crossroads, and and I don't know whether we still do, but at one point I know we had a waiting list to get into crossroads. People, people recognizing how successful the program is, and and you know, and, and assisting them to to make a, a life changing move. Uh, so my, my hope is is that is that um, we'll we'll come and we'll be supportive. Of course, we'll come to a point where where we're we're looking to see how we get them off the street. How do we how do we provide them with an education? How do we get them to a point where they can be self sustaining? Teach them to fish rather than giving them a fish. I would say what we learned in our data analysis, which is no surprise, but did confirm for us <coughs> that the mental health medical and addiction issues within the homeless population, if it doesn't get addressed, we won't get anywhere. Yes, understood. Thank you so much for your hard work again. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Hartung. Vice Chair Jung. Well, Commissioner Hartung said everything that I wanted to say, so. <laughs> I just have to, I know you were, I know you were. You're not the first nor the last. Um, what I think is the most important thing that we recognize as a community with the homelessness issue is every community has homelessness, right? It's part of living in a free society. Now, of course, in Singapore, there's no homelessness. There's also no spitting on the sidewalk. So two totally different forms of government. So it will be something that we have to deal with indefinitely. However, what you have done on the, of course, on the shoulders of Mr. Schiller, had with the Crossroads program is that you've legitimized to the governor and to the director of human services, who we stole you from, um, that, that evidence-based case management of people in trouble is the most sustainable way to do this. And this is the way we change lives. And by the way, homelessness affects every single person's family because of substance abuse disorder, behavioral problems, et cetera. So, I um, just have to tell you that this space and the security in this space for real transformation and change is something that you, I hope, use as a feather in your cap for your legacy. And you know you really, when you retire, which I'm not telling you to, you really could go around the country consulting on how to do this. And I, 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 I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, and moving, the county manager is telling. Oh, he wants to say something too. Oh no! Oh no! She's not going anywhere. Trust me, um, not for a while. But uh, what I want to tell you is that you really helped us as a commission. I think we all were on that same page, both cities as well. That <clears throat> warehousing people is no solution. We will always need warehouses because there are many people that don't want to get help. 
and the warehousing is important for those extremely hot days, those extremely smoky days, and then our very cold days. We will always need them, but the fact that we are giving people evidence-based, case-managed approach is, um, it's biblical, and I'm not even religious, but to me it's very biblical, and it's exactly what I think government should do, especially county government. So my hat's off to you, I'm getting teary. Um, and if anybody really wants to cry, you should look at her full presentation with the homeless guy and his dog, and you know, sometimes you just want two arms to hug you, and I just, this is why I'm in the business, because this is what matters to me, and I think that the vulnerable and the voiceless are who we should be custodians of. So I thank you so much. You are my idol. Thank you. Commissioner Hartung, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, do, I have a question. Um, so Ms. Hall, are, are, are we pretty much now using, and, and they've taken down the, the picture, I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry that they did that, are we now using the bulk of the campus, if not all of the campus? And the reason I ask this is because there's, there's been some conversations about um, some of the, the people that are taken to the SO, which don't belong in the SO. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering if there's some, a, a way that we can take some of that load off. There may be some actual funding to, to deal with that because it's very expensive mm -hmm. to, to process someone, to book them, to go through that whole, I mean, it, uh, the, the numbers that have that I recall are somewhere in the range of just to book them are you know three hundred plus dollars, just to get them and 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 many times and yeah and that's one person um, and and it, it's just a, it's a very very expensive way to handle that problem and I'm wondering if if there's the the possibility that that we can potentially morph something onto that onto that campus to say. Um, and 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 I don't and I don't know what it would look like necessarily, but I know that that many of the people that end up in the SO in the detention facility just don't belong there. It's it's because of it's because of mental health issues, mm -hmm. and there's a different way to handle it. And, and incarcerating them is not the solution. It's a very very expensive solution. In fact, yes, I would I would say that uh, you know just like we've we've talked to um, sheriffs and and their staff over the years. Places like Crossroads is a great diversion uh, for this population. And I think that the number that are in the sheriff's office and the volume is because we just don't have the capacity yes, to take. Exactly. And so if we don't invest and do programmatic um, things on the front end, there's nowhere for them to land. So part of the goal here, and hopefully um, this initiative will help, is that we will start looking at all of the men will be located at Record Street, and we want to start intaking those clients to see who can move into the Crossroads program so you don't have a bottleneck. Okay. The other piece that we're now actively trying to pursue is once the Crossroads clients end their program, we have 50 of them that are sitting and can't leave because they can't afford housing. So that's 50 beds, Crossroads beds, that are being taken up because there's nowhere to do a soft handoff for affordable housing. So we've taken care of the front end somewhat, but we have to take care of the back end to get them out of our program um, so that we can take more in. So we have a bottleneck in a couple of different places, and if we can start solving that, we can start relieving some of the inmates that are ending up in the sheriff's facility that really need a mental health and addiction treatment. So that's the goal. And, and, and perhaps I wasn't completely clear. I, I think that there are um, just behavioral issues where people get arrested and, and they take them up to the SO. So what, I, what, what I'm hopeful for, once we get this campus up and running, I'm hopeful that we can potentially create a space where we can, where we can work with the agencies and just say, because you know, a lot of times the path of least resistance is just arrest them and, and put them in jail. That's the, that's, the, you know, that's the path of least resistance. And, and that's not, this is not a pejorative comment about law enforcement. It's a, it's a comment about our, our, um, our infrastructure because there's nothing in place, there's no other place to take them. Mm -hmm. There is no, there's, there's no place that we have to say, okay, well, look, we've identified this guy, he's nonviolent, but you know, we have mental issues, we have, we have you know, potentially drug issues. How do we, 
is, is there a different place that we can, that we can take them um, and, and, and keep them out of, the, out of the jail's population? Because that certainly doesn't help them in, in you know, when, when they get in the jail's population, then, then it's a, you know, it's just a, it's a nightmare. And, and I know that we've, I know that we've tried to, you know, deal with uh, some of these issues with respect to, um, um, and I'm, and I'm not going to use the right term. I'll, I'll just call it, you know, sort of catch and release, where they, you know, they try to move them through the system, and it, they're, they're just nonviolent offenders, but they need to be someplace else. Right. So. I, uh, I 100% I agree with you. I think that's the goal. It's the same thing with building more beds uh, for the homeless shelter. We can build more prison beds and we can build more shelter beds. But until we start providing programming, we're just yes. going to continue to expand without services. And well, so that's the goal yep. of this. You are, you are truly amazing. I, I couldn't agree more. You're, I, I feel like, Commissioner Jung, you're my hero at this point. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a huge deal for Washoe County. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a huge deal. And, and for... People don't understand how far-reaching this actually is. The the tentacles that that go into other places where where we can we can start really reassessing how we deal with some of these issues. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you, Commissioner Hartung. Um, I am hoping that you will come back and give us progress reports as you move through this. And I, I, we will all be watching and working with you. And of course, you know if there's anything we can do, we want to be there for you. So thank you for everything you're doing. And I. Appreciate the fact that we have a really sharp, intelligent woman on the job. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for your support. I appreciate it. Thank you. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve and a second. I see no public comment. So we, uh, all those in favor of the vote, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Please cast your vote on the screen and then affirm your vote above. Motion carries three nothing with uh, both Commissioner Lucy and Commissioner Herman absent. Mr. Manager, I believe we're you on to, to 17. You want to go to 18? Oh, you want to go to 18? Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's more public Let's do the public item. hearing on 18. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Item 18 is public hearing. Uh, this is possible adoption of a resolution adopting master plan amendment case number WMPA 18-0001, the Sun Valley Area Plan which amends the Washington County Master Plan, Sun Valley Area Plan at Policy SUN.1.2 to remove the sentence, new single family detached residential, including mobile homes, will not be allowed within the DCMA. This is also a first reading and introduction of an ordinance adopting development code amendment case number WCEA 18-0001. Okay. Would you like your first reading, Madam Chair? Please. This, if, if introduced, will be bill number 1810, an ordinance amending the Washoe County Code at Chapter 110, Development Code of the Washoe County Code within Article 218, Sun Valley Area, Section 218.35A, to remove neighborhood commercial office zoning from the areas in which mobile homes and manufactured homes are prohibited to be placed within the Sun Valley Area. Thank you very much. Um, commissioners, we have public comment. Do you want to go to public comment or you want a presentation from staff? Okay, let's do public comment. First, we have Ms. Pamela Pappas. Good afternoon, Ms. Oops, it's still good morning, Ms. Pappas. Yeah. Uh, good morning. My name is Pamela Pappas, and I've commented a few times already, so I just really want to reiterate that. I hope that you, you know, amend this thing so that we can put our mobiles on our lots. Uh, Ron Bell has given you so many presentations. You know, I mean, we've been over and over it, so I don't think I have to say everything again. But I'm just here to, for some reinforcement, to please get this thing done so we can put mobiles on our lots. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Mr. Bill Anthony. Good morning, Mr. Anthony. Good morning, still. Still. County Commissioners. Um, a short synopsis. I moved here when I was five years old in 1956, so I, knew, I know a lot about how things have changed and grown and so forth. And 
to say we've gone through an awful lot of change in the last 20, 30 years is an <laughs> understatement. After I and my wife and one child at that time returned from serving in the Army for six years back in 1979-80, we helped start a family business in affordable housing, basically affordable housing ownership for the most part. And for a number of years, up until today, I've come to the county commissioners and city councilors and tried to express some common sense, reference affordable housing ownership over renting apartments, more apartments, more unofficial campsites down by the river, et cetera, to try to house people who are being brought to our neighborhood, brought to our community to service the big uh, effects. We call it the Tesla effect now, but we had the uh, uh, MGM Grand effect and the pepper mill. Then we had the Project C, which became uh, Silver Legacy, et cetera. And now we have this whole other county who apparently is not meeting their requirements on how to place Sim City, putting housing in their area, and they're counting on the, the outlying areas to, to house those people at our expense. But this is just a small part of things that I tried to encourage and preach on, both personally and also as in our pr profession. We established a, a family-owned business in uh, affordable housing with manufactured housing, mobile homes, brokering, uh, mobile offices, factory-built structures per, per se. And I got a lot of lip service over the years. I figured out it was a lip service from a lot of the uh, staff about, yeah, that's a great idea, Bill. We ought to do that. Well, that's good, yeah. And I said, yeah, you're kind of catching up with the rest of the, of the world, the rest of the United States, reference how to define even a manufactured home. Well, I'll go into a lot of detail because I don't have but 53 seconds left. I'm in favor of this because it's something that shouldn't have, been, shouldn't have been put in place in the first place. It should be taken out in the second place. Our families lived in five different locations in Sun Valley alone. We live in Sun Valley now. My eldest son lives in Sun Valley. And uh, the only thing else I could say, not to hold things up, is I don't know why you have to go through, uh, through a board of adjustment, uh, special use permits to put a manufactured home where it belongs in the first place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Ms. Pat Anthony. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. I'm the more beautiful half of that couple. <laughs> <laughs> and I am very thankful to have this platform to speak to you today. Um, we are obviously in favor of anything whereby affordable housing that was just discussed with the uh, beautiful job and presentation uh, just before us. And so, the and by the way, I, I am here as a like Catherine, a non-person, non-resident, unenfranchised natural woman. But allowing for people to have additions to their homes or granny flats or those sorts of things in all areas, we want to encourage because multi-generational support is very, very important. And it's like having your own little community, so to speak, on your own land and property. And we just think it's a great idea. We want to encourage that as much as we can. Thank you and Thank blessings you. to all of you. Thank you very much. Mr. Ron Bell. Could we have the overhead, please? Good morning, Mr. Bell. Two more minutes. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. And first of all, on behalf of myself and all the residents of Sun Valley, I'd like to thank all of you for winning the last appeal. Little did I know I'd have to go back to the Planning Commission again, and then here we are again to bless it once more. So I guess an approval of the approval of the approval, if you will. And I also want to personally thank uh, Roger and Trevor for such a wonderful job and the passion they've expressed throughout this whole process. You know, we're all pretty familiar with this. I agree with Pam, we're not gonna get into a dog and pony show. Um, you know, here we are three years later. My payments are $650 a month on my lot. Uh, I'm a block away from Sun Valley Boulevard. These are double-sided copies, so glad to be here, I guess. We do have one final hurdle, uh, the TMRPA. So if it's okay with council, for example, if you guys could do anything you can to contact any of those board members on the behalf of all of us, that would be great. If you could show up at that meeting, we would much appreciate it. So. 
<laughs> yeah, we still have some a little bit of work to do. So, what's that? Okay, yeah, all right. So, but there are other people there that, you know, we want to make sure this, this goes through. And of course, we do have an affordable housing crunch as well. You know, one important note, I wasn't here earlier, I, I was in another meeting, but, you know, there's always this dog and pony show with, they, they always show that land, rod on, land yacht on Sun Valley Boulevard. That actually couldn't be a more perfect example of why we want to lift this moratorium. That particular homeowner, he, his hands are tied. They can't put a new manufactured home on that. So actually, in fact, that's, you know, as much as you'd like to see a 7-Eleven there, which of course the setbacks don't allow, it's not going to happen. You're just going to continue to see decay and blight in, in these areas and people squatting on these lots. I mean, I've sat here before and said I get squatters all the time on my lot, have to clean it up constantly. I got the planning commission and neighbors on me. Important to note that, uh, you know, in this 2010, nobody was uh, notified of this at all. This hit a lot of us off guard, so that's very important to know. And also, of course, we met all the findings, staff met all the findings and recommendations of the development uh, findings, so we, we're pretty good there. So I think we're, you know, coming around, rounding third on this project. And what do we have, 30? So another example, I don't know if you can see this. Probably half the art, but again, you can see right here again a perfect example of do we want to continue having these dilapidated manufactured homes everywhere, or of course allow these manufactured homes back? So again, thank you for all your work, and hopefully I'll see you at the TMRPA meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Bell. Um, can I please get the items that you placed on the overhead right over here? Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, I see no more public comments, so we'll close public comment public comment and bring it back to the board. Commissioners, any questions for staff? Just a comment, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Commissioner um, Harta. Thank you. Um, this, this underlines my frustration with our inability to be nimble and, and to address some of these things. And this, this only just, it just makes sense. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Bell for being proactive. Uh, this is, Again, this, this just makes sense, and I can tell you that um, not having talked to Madam Chair, but we will shepherd this through through regional. Uh, it, it, again, this is, this is a no-brainer. This one is just a no-brainer, and I don't know, I don't know how this, this got enacted originally. I, I don't know the, the reasons behind it, um, but, but you know, it, in, in my opinion, um, it's immaterial. We are where we are, and so I would move to introduce um, Bill Number 1810, um, the next reading for the final reading to occur on October 23rd. Thank you very much. Yes, Vice Chair Jung. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I want to thank um, the citizens of Sun Valley that came out here. I just for a little bit of history, this was a, a way that um, Sun Valley thought they were going to beautify their community in that area, and it just turns out it landlocked owners, and we are in a situation that we need all the land we can get at this point, especially at affordable rates. So, um, and I also wanted to let you know that in earlier public comment, a, a realtor was here in support of the affirmative is here as well as the others. So thank you, Sun Valley residents, for pushing and never giving up that this indeed could happen, and thank you, staff. I've heard nothing but great um, feedback. Oh, you are here, I'm sorry, the realtor that was here, I'm sorry. She did speak in the affirmative during general public, so I fully support this, and thank you, Commissioner Hartung, for introducing it. If you, if, if, Commissioner no. Jung, I can, I can remove the introduction if you would like to be on the I'll record. Be done for about <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair. We're renaming Quartz Lane to Kitty Jung Boulevard. <laughs> Mr. Liparelli. Uh, Commissioner uh, Hartung and Commissioner Jung can share because there's a second part of this uh, item that requires the adoption of a resolution. Uh, Commissioner Hartung's motion was to introduce the bill. So, the bill. So yeah. uh, let's have a motion on the resolution. Do we need to? Don't we need to take the vote on the? <laughs> or we can do it all at once. Okay. Commissioner Herman is sitting here. So oh, I got here late, but and I don't know if anybody mentioned this, but uh, all this bill and everything it it's going to be a way to get some affordable housing that's yeah. what i like been mentioned yes you're right it is right. 
Okay, Vice Chair Jung. Sorry, a, um, so this is also at the point that I um, adopt, a resolution. adopt a resolution of this case number. And I don't know, do I, does that require a second, Mr.? Yes. Okay. That's a motion. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We've done public comment. So, so that is, so just, just for clarification, that's uh, case number WMPA 18-0001. Which amends the master plan. Correct. Yes, that's sir, motion. thank you. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Please cast your vote on the screen and affirm your vote above. Most motion passes for nothing with Commissioner Lucy absent. Thank you very much. Good job, guys. Boy, did you give a good presentation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. to remain silent, Roger. Mr. Manager, let's go back to 17 and do the introduction and first reading. Yes, item 17 is, is an introduction and first reading of an ordinance amending Washington County Code Chapter 110. Okay to change the number of van accessible handicap parking spaces required in accordance with the Washington County Code. So. I just have a, I have a question for staff. It's a first reading. Oh yes, it's first reading, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. If, it, if introduced, this will bear our bill number 1811, an ordinance amending the Washington County Code at Chapter 110, Development Code, to change the number of van accessible handicap parking spaces required in accordance with Washoe County Code Table 110.410.15.1 from one per eight handicap parking spaces to one per six handicap parking spaces for any parking facility serving the public and to address other matters necessarily connected therewith and pertaining thereto. <coughs> Mr. Manager, Madam thank Chair, you. just, uh, uh, and I'm not sure what specific question Commissioner Hartung has, but when I first read this, I, I clarified this increases the number of Correct. handicap. Yes, parking a, yes. a van accessible yes. handicap. Yes, is Go this, ahead. and, and, and if I may, Madam Chair, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Lloyd, um, is, is this just a, a part of our ongoing cleanup of the code? Because it, it we, we were not in conformance prior to, if, if, if I read it correctly, in the, the section of the developmental code that was amended in 93. This, if, if I may, and, and through the chair, uh, certainly to, to respond to uh, Commissioner Hartung's uh, question. Uh, again, Trevor Lloyd with Planning and Building. Uh, is and that on? Excuse me, 2012. I'm, I'm sorry, in 2000, it was amended in 2012. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Is this on? Okay, now, now it's, it's on. on. There you're on. Yes. That's better. Okay, and, and if I may, my understanding is that uh, this is to bring this, this standard into compliance with right. the IBC, the International right. Building Code, and to reflect the, uh, the standard set by the, uh, the uh, DOJ's uh, ADA standards. Right, yes. good. Okay, e exactly, okay. Move okay. to introduce bill number 1811, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it, Mr. Lloyd. So, um, and when is its next hearing? Uh, the next hearing will be on October 23rd, the second All right. meeting. Super. So with that, I see no public comment on that. So with that, we will close um, that and move on to item 19, I understand, is off the agenda, Mr. Co Manager. Correct. That takes us to item 20, which is public comment. I see no public comment. So we will close public comment, bring it back to the board. Item 21 is Commissioner, County Manager's announcements, reports, updates, requests for information or topics for future agendas. Do you have anything, Mr. Manager? Uh, I, I would. Uh, we earlier. Um, during the earlier commissioner manager's announcements, there was a request for some information regarding Mr. Fossum's uh, voting records. Um, I've, uh, uh, voter registrar has already gotten back with me and notes that he is only in the system once, but we will talk, uh, discuss with Mr. Fossum uh, possible other issues that, that he may mm -hmm. be seeing, so. Okay, good, thank you very much. Commissioners, any comments? I'm not sure. Okay, we will close number 21, and with that, we are adjourned.